Amen. God is good. And Jesus changes everything. Amen. That's why we're here this morning, because Jesus has changed our lives. When you put Jesus Christ, as this young man shared in this video, this testimony, Jesus can take the worst sinner and make them new and whole again. He is risen. Amen. And so we celebrate today. If you have your Bibles and would turn with me to Romans chapter 3, we're going to be looking, I mean, excuse me, Romans 4, 25. And we have it up here. I want you to hear what it has to say this morning. It says, he was handed over to die because of our sins. And he was raised to life to make us right with God. Amen. All of us have sinned and come short of the glory of God. But God so loved us that he sent his only son to die on a cross for us, that we might not have the eternal punishment, but that we might inherit life, that we might be made right with God. Amen? Let's pray. Father, I thank you for your word today. And Lord, I ask that it will touch our lives in the few remaining moments that we have. Lord, we pray that, Lord, our lives will, will be changed in, a, in an incredible way this morning because of you and what you did at Calvary. We give you the praise and the glory for it in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, amen, amen. amen. Jesus really does change everything. You know, I want you to think about this. 33 AD, just before Jesus died on the cross, you know, he started out with 12 disciples. Disciples mean learner. That was quite common in that particular season of history for rabbis to have disciples. But through his ministry, he didn't really have a lot of followers. It grew to 120 and then several hundred followers. I was looking up on the internet today, and if these statistics are correct, there are 2.6 billion Christians in the world today. Isn't that amazing? How did that happen? How did uh, just Jesus and a ragtag group of wannabe fishermen change the world, to, to grow this ministry to over 2.6 billion. Think about that. That's, uh, that's about one in every three people profess to be Christians in our world today. Isn't that incredible? I'll give you some perspective about that. Uh, that is a larger number than the population of China. Uh, China has a bunch of folk. So we say in Mississippi. But it's even larger than that. Think of it this way. It's more than the population of China and Europe combined. Christians who have professed Jesus into their heart as Lord and Savior. In fact, it's even larger than that. If the, the statistics I read are correct, there are more Christians than the population of China, Europe, and the United States. Wow. Well, how did that happen? Well, the Word of God, thank you, but the resurrection. This is something that separates Christianity from all the other 4,200 religions. Jesus Christ rose from the dead, made a difference. You know, I'm, I'm really amazed. You've heard me say this before, but it just staggers me to think that, you know, that many Christians, and yet Jesus never wrote a book. But there have been more books written about Jesus than any other subject in history. You know, Jesus never wrote a song. I'm a songwriter. Colossians says he sang songs and hymns and spiritual songs. 
but never wrote a song. And yet, there have been more songs written about Jesus than any other subject. Uh, think about that. Jesus didn't travel a lot. In fact, as you study the Bible, he didn't travel more than 200 miles from where he was born. Uh, Jesus never built a, a big Ephesus or a building. Yet there have been more buildings dedicated to the glory of God and his son, Jesus Christ, than any other. Wow. Jesus never painted a painting, never used charcoal on canvas, never sculpted, and yet there are more art, designs, statues about the ministry of Jesus than any other. Wow. Wow. So how did this ragtag team, Jesus and the, these Jewish fishermen, a lot of them, I know there was a couple of accountants and that type of thing, but grew to 2.6 billion. I want to challenge you today. It's because of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Think about the resurrection. Think about what happened then. In fact, your birthday. Think of your birthday. Mine's June 14, 1961. 1961 from what? From the resurrection of Jesus Christ. There's no other world figure in history that can say that. Jesus Christ changes everything. And that's why uh, people like the disciples gave their lives, were martyred, because they witnessed Jesus Christ, the Messiah. You know, I heard recently on the internet, someone boast or was boasting from the Islamic group saying, well, Jesus never claimed to be the Messiah. Find one scripture in your Bible that says Jesus claimed to be the Messiah. Well, there's several. I'm like, what, what amazed me is there's a lot, of, a lot of Christians scratching their head. Well, did he? John 4. The latter part, we, we preach about the woman at the well. Remember that? And, and we... You know, and I'm guilty of this too. We kind of pause in the middle of that story about when Jesus said, look, if you drink the water I'll give you, you'll never thirst again. And we rejoice and we do, uh, you know, Jericho marches and we jump up and down and we, th we talk about eternal life, but the story doesn't end there, does it? Need to read a few more verses. And finally, the woman at the well admits that, well, she's talking to Jesus, and she says, well, you know, someday, one day, don't know when, but the Messiah is going to come, and he's just going to clear all this up. And Jesus said, you're looking at him. You're looking at the Messiah. The New Living Translation says, he said, I am the Messiah. Jesus, I, John, I'm getting off my notes, but Jesus said, uh, I and the Father are one. Philip asked Jesus, listen, when are we going to get to see the Father? And what, what did Jesus say to Philip? He said, if you've seen me, yes, yeah, some of you good Bible students, if you've seen me, You've seen the Father. And I better get back to my notes or I could just keep going on and on and on. But Jesus changes everything. <clears throat> How did Christianity grow so far and so fast with just 12 guys on the backside of the desert? It grew to 2.6 billion. What made it contagious was the gospel. What is the gospel? The nutshell of the gospel is simply this. That God loved you so much 
that he sent Jesus Christ, the Messiah, to die on a cross for our sins. The Bible says the wages of sin is what? Death. Yeah, you guys get up here and preach this message. I don't need to preach it. You guys know it. But it doesn't stop there, does it? It says, but the gift of God. This is the good news. The gift of God is what? Eternal life. And that's why we celebrate today. This is why we rejoice today. This is why some of you might do a Jericho march or something like that, because we have something to celebrate. Jesus Christ is alive and has given those who receive them, him into their hearts eternal life. That's not my words. These are the words of the gospel. For God so loved the world, that's you and I, it's outside these doors, that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believes in him should not perish, but have what? Everlasting life. That's what Jesus came to do, to make us right with God, to give us everlasting life if we call upon his name. And not only that, he proved that he was the son of God because he died and rose again, just like the prophets foretold. He proved that he truly was the Son of God. People say, well, he never claimed to be the Son of God. Oh, well, there's a, we can go down that rabbit trail. Before Abraham was, I am. You know, the word Yahweh means to be. So when he said before Abraham was, I am, he just wasn't being cute. The Jewish people knew what he was saying, and they picked up stones to do what? Stone him for blasphemy. In fact, we're going to get, when he was facing the cross, when he was getting ahead of myself, but he was standing before Pilate. The one thing that they, the one thing that they could come up against Jesus was that he claimed to be God. Well, he was God. And that was his only accusation made against him. So there are six benefits. I want to go through these really quickly. And uh, Pastor Jordan was reminding me that I need to speak quickly so people's roast or ham don't burn up in the oven. So I'm going to go through these six present-day benefits real quickly. Number one, I don't have to live with guilt and shame because Jesus paid for my sin on the recross. As a pastor, I face a lot of people that have regrets, guilt, shame, things that they, they've done. If I were to ask you to make a quick list of the things that you have done in your past that you're ashamed of or, or that you feel guilty toward when you think about those things. It wouldn't take us very long to come up with a list, would it? Jesus didn't come to make us feel guilty. In fact, John 3, 17 says that he didn't come to condemn the world. You know, sometimes the, the devil, when we blow it or say something or do something or engage in something that we know is not right, you hypocrite. And he tries to heap condemnation on us. First of all, none of us are perfect, but it's because of God's love and grace that covers our sin. If we confess our sins, this is 1 John chapter 1. 1 John says this, and he's speaking to Christians here. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us of our sin and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Isn't that incredible? We have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, who loves us, doesn't want us to walk in shame. And yes, when we do blow it, we can come before him and say, Father, forgive us. 
Someone asked me, well, how long will it take for him to forgive you? Instantly. Before you can get the word forgive me out of your mouth, he forgives us. Amen? Maybe you're watching on the internet or listening by way of radio today. I want to encourage you. Just call on the name of the Lord. The Bible tells us, call on the name of the Lord. Whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved, period. We have someone who loves us and cares for us. Here's what Ephesians 1, 7 says. It says, for by the blood of Christ, for by the blood of Christ, we are set, say this word, free. Amen. That is, our sins are forgiven. Just think about how great the grace of God is that our sins are forgiven. But it wasn't cheap. Cost God his very own son. In fact, Jesus Christ was so popular that they had to arrest him at night. He had six sham trials. If you've read the Word of God, the New Testament, you know this to be true. Three religious trials, three Roman trials. He stood before Annas and Caiaphas and literally the religious Supreme Court, the Sanhedrin. He stood before Pilate, who was the Roman governor, and then back to Herod and then to Pilate, all in the middle of the night. And so we know that these trials were illegal because it was illegal to have a trial at night. But they wanted to rush things through. They wanted to snuff out the voice of Jesus. And so at any cost, even at the cost of justice, they ramrod this, these trials through. And after six trials, you know, they, you know what they found Jesus guilty of? Nothing, except, as I mentioned earlier, that he claimed to be God. And so he was sentenced to be executed by crucifixion. But even before Jesus went to the cross... He experienced pain. You know, something interesting in my study, you know, the pain of crucifixion was so extreme that they had to invent a word to describe the pain of cru crucifixion. The word that we use today is excruciating pain. It's a derivative of this this execution means out of the cross. But Jesus experienced enormous physical abuse and emotional abuse. He was kept up all night without sleep. Keep me up all night without sleep. I'm grouchy. Ask my wife. Or up all night without food. I'm even worse. They blindfolded him. They mocked him, beat him, hit him in the face. They spit on him. They plucked his beard <coughs> and asked him, who is it that just hit you? Who is it that just plucked your beard? Well, Jesus could have given them the name, their family, their distant relatives, addresses and all, but he didn't. The Bible says that he spoke not a word unto them. Isaiah 53, 7. Oh, you're a king. Oh, you're some king of the Jews. And so they formed a crown of thorns and placed it upon his head. And then they scourged him. A scourging isn't like a typical whipping. It's, it's a whipping on steroids. It had nine strands that came out. And it, on the end of it had like bits of bone or metal or sharp objects. And so when you received one strike on the back, it was like receiving nine. And they would pull it off of the back because it would claw into the back. So the Bible tells us he had 40 save one. What does that mean? It means he had 39 because 
if whoever was administering the scourge went over 40, you couldn't go over 40, then you had to experience the same 40 lashes. So they just went 39 in case someone miscounted. And 39 lashes of the nine cattails would be 351 lashes. That's a lot. I had to get out a calculator to, to do 39 times nine. I know some of you are, are just gifted in math. You can, oh, pastor, that's easy. I have to use a calculator still. Um, and my dad, he has on his wall a slide rule. I wouldn't even know where to begin with a slide rule. Some of you know what I'm talking about. Then they gave him a heavy cross and led him to Golgotha, which is also another word for Calvary. And they nailed his hands and feet to the cross. And when he died, they stuck a spear into his side. And he went through all that because he was thinking of you. He wasn't thinking of himself. He was thinking of you. In fact, when they were nailing him to the cross, he cried out, Father, Father, forgive them for they don't even know what they're doing. Let me ask you, who do you think killed Jesus? Well, it wasn't Judas. I mean, that would be a good guess, but it wasn't Judas. It wasn't Caiaphas, the high priest. It wasn't Pilate, the Roman governor. It wasn't even the Roman soldiers or the crowd that cried crucify him. So who put Jesus on the cross? Well, the two, there's two answers, and I think they'll surprise you, and some of you have already guessed. The first answer is this. God did. What? Pastor, God did? Yeah. In fact, Jesus said in John 18, 37, it was for this purpose that I was born, and for this purpose I came into the world to die. But Isaiah chapter 53, which for many people is the forget, uh, uh, forbidden chapter, tells us and gives us the picture of what happened. Let me read this to you. Verse, 30, verse 6 says, All of us, like sheep, have gone astray. We've left God's path to follow our own way. In other words, we've sinned. Yet the Lord laid on him the guilt and sin of us all. God is saying in this passage that I'm responsible, the Lord, to pay for the sins. It goes on to say, the Lord laid on him the guilt and sins of us all. He was oppressed and treated harshly, yet he never said a word. He was led as a lamb to the slaughter from prison and trial. They led him away to his death. But who among the people realized that he was dying for their sin. He was suffering for their punishment. He had done no wrong and he never deceived anyone, but he was buried like a criminal. He was put in a rich man's grave, but it was from, but it was the Lord's good plan to bruise him and fill him with grief. However, when his soul has been made an offering for sin, then he shall have a multitude of children. And that's a paraphrase from the Living Bible. I think it just kind of paints the picture that we all need to hear that, first of all, it was part of God's plan. But then, secondly, the second answer is we. God showed his great love for us by sending Christ to die for who? Us. If we had never sinned, would Jesus have to die on a cross? No. Because of his love, Christ died. Because we were still sinners. God commends his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Amen? God's love, God's grace, 
in God's mercy. The second point this morning is this. I don't have to fear death. That's something that a lot of people fear. In fact, some people just, that's all they talk about is death. It's, it's the number one topic. Listen, you don't have to fear death. Yes, all of us are going to die unless the rapture takes place. All of us are going to taste death, but we don't have to fear death. And one of the reasons that Christianity spread to 2.6 billion people is because there were eyewitnesses of the resurrection. Because I live, you shall live also. And there are many witnesses to, to this fact. Look at 2 Peter 1.16. I'm going quickly. I don't want the hams to burn, casseroles to burn. Amen. I'm teasing you. 2 Peter 1.16. For we were not making up clever stories when we told you about the powerful coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. We saw his majestic splendor with our own eyes. This is after the resurrection. Not only did Peter see it, but dozens of others. Acts 1-3, we talked about this last week. Look at what it says. For 40 days after his death, Jesus appeared to people many times in many ways that proved beyond a doubt that he was alive. They saw him. He talked to them about the kingdom of God. And, and as we mentioned last week, and I'm not going to repeat, but even up to 30 years after he ascended to heaven, they were still, there were still people alive sharing that they were eyewitnesses. Now, that's, that's important, being an eyewitness Corinthians, 1 Corinthians 15, 3 through 8 says, Christ died for our sins, just as the scripture said. He was buried, and then he was raised from the dead. And on the third day, he was seen by Peter, and then by the 12 apostles. After that, he was seen by, listen to this, more than 500 of his followers at one time. So it wasn't a mass illusion. Those things don't happen. 500 witnesses that Jesus Christ was alive. That's what you would call conclusive proof. Irrefutable, definitive evidence. So Christianity spread from 12 to 2.6 billion. Wow. Number three, I'm going to move quickly. God's Spirit empowers me. Because He is risen we can know that we have his spirit to empower us. Acts 1.8 says, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you and you will be my witnesses. You will be. But what does God want me to be? He wants you to be a witness for him. We shared this last week. I want to share it with you. Ephesians 1, 19 and 20. You may want to underline this in your Bible. This is an important verse. Listen to what it says. I pray that you'll begin to understand how incredibly great his power is to help those who believe him. I love this last part. It is the same mighty power that raised Christ Jesus from the dead. When you invite Jesus Christ into your heart, his spirit comes to dwell in you. It's the same spirit that raised our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ from the dead. That is the kind of power that's in you. Sometimes we don't recognize that or we don't realize that. And we allow the enemy to rob us how God wants to work in us. Amen? I don't know if all of you are picking up what I'm laying down. Amen. But that's good preaching. He's alive and in you. Let's jump over to four. I'm unconditionally loved 
by God. And we've been talking about this morning because God is love. It doesn't say he has love. The Bible says he is love. Amen. John 13, 34 and 35 says this. Because many religions are all about, well, you got to keep this, you got to do that, you got to live by this law or this regulation. Christianity is different from that. It's all about love. For God so loved that he gave his only begotten son. The next verse I want you to see is John 13, 34, talking about giving a, a commandment or a law or keeping a law. In Christianity, it's all about love. I am giving you a new commandment to do what? Yes, that's the King James Version. Love one another. Love each other just as he's loved you. And how does Jesus love you? Conditionally or unconditionally? I, like I said, you guys could preach this sermon. He loves you unconditionally. So how are we to love our neighbor? Really? Do we do that? Sometimes. There, the truth comes out. Sometimes. I, I struggle with that. I know. I'm a pastor. Your love for one another will prove to the world that you are my disciples. This world would be a better place if we would love like Jesus loves us. If we would love others like Jesus loves us. Amen? And number five, if you're taking notes, I can live with purpose and meaning because of the resurrection. Because Jesus changes everything. Listen, you're not an accident. Your parents may not have planned you, but God did. You have a purpose and a plan. And yet, there's, for many people, an emptiness inside that they're trying to feel. And you can only feel that emptiness with the love of Jesus Christ. And many people will go a lifetime trying to fill that emptiness with sex, food, workaholic, workaholicism or however you want to say it. I'm creating words. Fame, golf. I like that last one a bit, but I don't have to fill my life with golf to have meaning. Uh, these different things in the right way can, can be meaningful in your life. But what fills the void in our hearts and soul is Jesus Christ. Ephesians 2 says that, that when Jesus Christ comes into our life, he has a good work that he planned in advance for us to do. God has something he wants you to accomplish. God has a purpose for you. Ephesians 2, 8 through 10. Great verse. You have meaning. Paul said, Philippians 1, 21, now, how can you defeat a guy like this who says, for me, living is for Christ, and dying is even better? He's facing the executioner's blade. And he says, look, if they acquit me and, I, and I'm set free, wonderful. I'm going to make every moment count and live for Christ. If they decide to chop my head off, it's even better. I'm going to be with my Lord and Savior in who I love. And finally, the sixth point I want you to see. Can, I can't believe I got through six points on the Easter morning. And everybody said, well, you don't have to say it so loud. Come on. <laughs> Amen. Hallelujah in there too. Uh-oh. Because of the resurrection, I can be certain. I'm going to heaven. Because that grave is empty, we can know that there's a place for us in heaven. Well, Pastor, Jesus didn't need to die. I'm a good person. 
What did Jesus say about that? No, there's no one good except God. That's not even a criteria. I, I shared this a few weeks ago. It's not all the good things that you do, and, and we need to do good things. But it's not good things that get you into heaven. And really, it's not bad things that get you into hell. Can I say that? Those are just fruits. If you accept Jesus Christ into your heart, you should be bearing good fruits, doing good things. Well, I can do good things without Jesus. No. I'm better than my neighbor. Well, you may be better than your neighbor, but you are not perfect. And the only way you could ever get into heaven is less, unless you lived a perfect life. And I don't think anyone in here can testify that they're perfect. Let me just prove it to you. How many have ever taken a pen? You know, you borrowed a pen and took it to your car or something. Let me see. Okay, a few hands, a few honest people. All right, how many would say, boy, you know, you, didn't, you were talking, you didn't quite tell the whole truth. It was just a little white lie. How many would? Get there. Our church is filled with liars and thieves. Oh, my goodness. The point I'm trying to make is, listen, none of us are perfect, right? And Jesus knew that. And because of God's enormous love for you, he made a way. And Jesus, when he was on that cross, bore all the sin, pain, that really we deserve. As I mentioned earlier, the wages of sin is death. He paid the price for you. I, I was, it was interesting. In the last two or three weeks, I've gotten two nails in my tire. The same tire. Went down to the, it's a Chevrolet, so I took it to the Chevrolet dealer and both times they, they fixed it. And I said, well, how much do I owe you? And they said, Nothing. Nothing. In fact, this last time, just two days ago, Good Friday, I took it in, and they gave me a brand new tire. Well, how much do I owe you? Nothing. And here's what, because you made a decision when you bought this car, to take out a little coverage to cover your tire protection. You're already co you're covered. I, I know this is oversimplified illustration, but listen to me, church. When you invite Jesus Christ into your heart, you're covered. You're covered. When you stand before God, one day, you're covered. The Father's going to say, the Son of my blood, uh, son of my Son's blood covered every sin. Enter thou into the joys of heaven. Well done, thou good and faithful servant. You're covered. Covered. And one of these days, because Jesus died on the cross and rose again. Here's what Paul said. If Jesus didn't rise from the dead, we are of all people most miserable. There's no hope. But because he is alive, we have a place in heaven for eternity. You know what Jesus said? We... We, we can't even imagine, I'm kind of putting it in my vernacular, what God has prepared for those who trust him. For you. For every single one that receives Christ into their heart. That's why I've spent my entire lifetime trying to get as many people into heaven 
response. That's why we call ourselves frontline. We want to be on the front lines, reaching people from, for Christ, keeping them from the gates of hell. That's our mission, to be on the front lines. That's why we call ourselves Frontline Christian Center. Let me ask you, are you on the front lines? Are you telling your neighbors, your friends, the people you work with, your, your relatives, are you telling them how much God loves them? That's your job. Whether they receive it or not, that's between them and God. Our job is to be his mouthpiece. Amen? And I, I know some of your hams have already burned, but I've gone a little long this morning, but we're going to pray. Because I, I think on this very special occasion, the most important day in all of Christendom is, is Resurrection Day. And I want to pray for you. With every head bowed and every eye closed, you're here. And we're, it's just a simple, simple question. Have you invited Jesus Christ into your heart? Maybe you're watching online. Maybe you're listening by radio. Maybe you're in your home or driving down the interstate. Have you invited Jesus Christ into your heart? And if you haven't, I have good news today. By simply inviting him into your heart, Jesus Christ will change everything. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these other things will be added unto you. That's finances, that's relationships, that may be not where they're supposed to be. Any number of things that you may be going through, when you put Jesus Christ first in your life, it changes everything in your life, period. If Jesus is not first in your life, everything in your life will be out of whack. And that's why I continue to proclaim this truth that Jesus changes everything. Everything. And some of you need the Lord to just move in your life in a profound way. With every head bowed and every eye closed, you're here today. And you'd be honest, you'd say, Pastor, I need God's grace, I need God's forgiveness. I need God's help today. You'd simply raise your hand and say, Pastor, that's me. Raise your hand right up, right down. God sees, yes, 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 yes. A number of hands. Amen. I'm going to invite you to stand with me as we close in prayer. I want you to pray this prayer with me. And if you're watching online or if you're listening by way of radio, and you're serious, and you mean it, I want you to pray this prayer with me, and Jesus will change your life. Pray this prayer with me. If you're a Christian, you've prayed this before or some similar type of prayer. Say, Heavenly Father, I come to you in Jesus' name. I'm a sinner in need of a Savior. Forgive me of all my sin. Cleanse me from all unrighteousness. I make a decision to live for you as you give me strength. I know that you sit at the right hand of the Father and rose again that I might live an abundant life for you. Give you praise for it. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. If you prayed that prayer, the Bible says your name is written in the Lamb's book of life, that the angels are rejoicing. Amen. Amen. Happy Resurrection Day. Amen. God is good. And all the time, God is good. Uh, go in the power of our Lord and Savior. May his grace be with you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.